One of the reasons Outer Wilds attracted a lot of attention is due to the complexity of its world behavior. The development team made a very difficult decision, which is basically calculating in real time how the astros and objects interact with each other. They use a bunch of physical models and for this reason many refer to this game as a space exploration simulator. Maybe the biggest example is the planet's orbits. It is not forced by code. In fact, it arises from the given properties to each object and, of course, from the theory of gravitation. In this game, the sun is really attracting the planets and you too. In most games, the behavior of objects is simplified to the maximum. The goal is to make everything as accurate as possible and also to be as light as possible. From the moment that Outer Wilds team decided to simulate many complex behaviors, even if the player is not nearby, this brought some problems. The purpose of this video is to explain what they are, and how they were solved. But first, we need to understand two strategies normally used to prevent game physics from being too much computer intensive. Many simulation math happening at the same time can be very tricky to computers. This is even worse in games, because you must run the simulation for a long time. One technique many game engines use is to stop doing all the math on every frame. Instead, the calculations are done not according to frames, but to a chosen time step. It can be 0.1 seconds for example. While normally a game at 30 frames per second would calculate physics 30 times. If this time step was used, it would decrease to only 10 times. The reason this strategy works is because the behavior of objects almost never changes abruptly. Of course, using a big time step lead to the physics engine losing a lot of accuracy. Therefore, games that aim for a precise behavior, should use a smaller time step. It's pretty reasonable to think that objects very far from the character need not to be active and have their behavior being processed. The second strategy is basically to implement that in games. This is very similar to techniques used in rendering. For clear reasons, this is very common in open world games, like GTA, which was known to disappear with cars when they left the game's camera. Now that you briefly understand both techniques, let's try to apply them to Outer Wilds. As the game has a lot of physics to calculate the character movement and his interactions with the world, increasing the time step would not be desirable. In fact, the ideal would even be to keep it small. Now looking at the second strategy, there is another problem. The dev team wanted to keep the planets working, even without the player close to them. In short, the two main strategies for making simulations less heavy, are not much compatible with the philosophy of the game. Now the question remains. How to solve these problems? The answer to this question can be found while looking at some of the decisions the dev team had in their level design. Let's analyze the game's solar system to better understand that. Logan, one of the team's programmers, said in an interview that when the character is far from the planets, their phenomena are calculated in a simpler way. Some objects even have simplified colliders. In an environment full of physical objects, free to interact and collide, that would be a big problem. By simplifying colliders, you can accidentally move objects in unexpected ways, making them enter each other, adding kinetic energy, etc. But why is that not a problem in this game? The answer is simple, the planets of Outer Worlds don't have many interactive objects, with a few exceptions. There are even celestial bodies that are practically static. For this reason, in general what the dev team really need to worry about were few things from each planet. So basically, Outer Worlds choose very well what to simulate. 
It is a question that concerns game design. Is it a big deal for the Outer Wilds experience to spend processing with decorative dynamic objects? The team's answer was no. Okay, that simplifies things, but Outer Wilds still have a big problem. There are several physical phenomena in the game, many of them interacting with other important objects. Let's understand the complexity of each one of them, and then understand if there was any strategy to deal with it. Let's begin our analysis with the Hourglass Twins. Together, these two planets create a very interesting behavior as the sand goes from one to the other. Because of that, we are slowly gaining access to towers in Ash Twin, and losing access to caves in Ember Twin. There are three phenomena constantly happening in these planets, the sand blasting, and the two changing sand levels. In interviews, developers talked a little about how they were programmed. To represent the sand level, there is a sphere in each planet. It changes its radius according to time. One increases the radius, the other decreases. They use a shader to make the object less spheric as possible. The sand blasting is just an object that puts a constant force on anything physical touching it. Other than these three objects, nothing change in the planet's state. If the player, the scout and the spaceship are far, all the colliders could be deactivated or simplified. In the dark bramble, we see an almost completely empty place, divided into individual rooms. There are two types of objects, the anglerfish and the giant moving stones. The anglerfish don't move until they hear noise. So without a player to make noise, there is no reason to run the routines of the monsters. The two giant stones on the planet are moving and rotating, but they never leave the room. When they collide with something, there is a sound effect, but it doesn't seem to activate the anglerfish. As the planet is divided in isolated rooms, probably everything can be deactivated if no spaceship, scout or character are inside. This planet is the opposite of static. There are five types of objects, the islands, the tornadoes, the ship that is adrift, the orbital probe cannon orbiting the planet, and the jellyfish. The tornadoes move through the planet and, when colliding with something, they throw it outside the atmosphere. The gravity then pulls it back. They probably are programmed very similarly to the sand blasting from hourglass twins. The islands floats in the water, and so does the Gabros ship. They are objects that keep being pushed by the tornadoes. The Nomai orbital probe is just orbiting the planet, similar to a moon. It is not clear if it can collide with any of the islands. The jellyfish have a regular behavior of going up and down. They can't be pushed. Some of these elements don't seem to gain angular velocity or change its movement when colliding with the player's spaceship or the tornadoes. So even if it has no character, spaceship or scout, this planet needs to have some crucial elements calculated. In Timber Hearth, the only dynamic elements are geysers, but they only interact with the scout, spaceship or the character. These elements don't change the planet's state. We don't need to talk much about the Atla Rock, because there is no dynamic object on it. Basically, both have almost nothing to calculate and could easily be simplified. In Brittle Hollow, there are three key elements, the fragments of the surface, the fire projectiles, and the black hole. Each fragment has a life value that decreases every time a lava projectile collide. When the life reaches zero, the fragment fall on the black hole. The black hole is an object of huge mass. In the game, when something touch it, it gets warped to a white hole. The hollow's lantern lava surface is getting smaller every projectile fired. And visual effects similar to the sphere from hourglass twins. The lava projectiles are dynamic objects fired with an initial velocity and constantly being pulled by the brittle hollow's gravity. This is another planet with complex behavior, similar to giant steep in complexity. The surface collider could be simplified, but the object's behavior must continue being processed. 
The quantum moon has six static states, I, Timber Hearth, Giant's Deep, Brittle Hollow, Hourglass Twins, and Dark Bramble. The quantum tower and Selenum's ship position keep changing, but they only need to be simulated if the player is inside the moon. The complexity of this celestial body emerges from the management of where it is orbiting and which state is active. The Intellipa is an almost completely static body, except for a hole blocked by ice. The state of the hole opening depends on how far the asteroid is from the Sun. When it is near, the passage is opened, when it is far, it freezes and closes. Inside the Intellipa there are dead bodies, but they can't be pushed by the player. Probably the melting process, and the bodies, only need to be active when the spaceship, character or the scout are near. And finally, the Sun. It has a solar station in orbit, but like the orbital probe cannon, it doesn't interact dynamically with the character. The Sun's supernova behavior is something gradually happening, not just in color but in size. On almost every part of the solar system you can see it. Now that we have an overview of all the celestial bodies, we can classify them according to their state's change. We can use a range that goes from completely static to very dynamic. Outer worlds have completely static planets such as Timber Hearth and Dark Bramble. We also have some celestial bodies that as state change, but not in very complex ways such as Hourglass Twin, the Sun, and Quantum Moon. And finally some planets that are changing their states in very complex ways, such as Giant Steep and Brittle Hollow. They need almost a real-time simulation of each involved object. This analysis was the last step missing. Now we can answer the question properly. After this overview of the solar system, we can join some pieces and understand how the dev team solves the problem of simulating all the planets. The decision to have almost no decorative physical objects on the planets was very intelligent, as it gives priority to processing really significant interactions, besides avoiding problems with the collider's shape simplification. As we could see in the analysis, not only Outer Worlds tries to balance the existence of dynamic celestial bodies and static ones, it also simplifies the simulation of complex behavior. For instance the life system of the brittle hollow fragments and the spheres from the hourglass twins. The writers created such a mysterious story and game designers such curious planets that even static planets are interesting. These decisions are so clever and well made that most of the players don't realize them. These are good decisions. This is good game design. And this is the Outer Worlds approach to a world simulation.